morning and can I welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one, the committee is invited to consider and agree whether to take agenda items five, six and seven in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and at this point, uh, I'd like to invite Annabelle Ewing to declare any relevant interest. Uh, thank you, convener. And just really, I wanted to uh, flag up to the committee that I have uh, decided on an early basis to update my entry in the register of interest. Specifically, I now rent out a flat in Edinburgh on a normal residential lease basis. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, agenda item two, the committee will take evidence on the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman's Annual Report and Accounts 2017-18. And I welcome to today's meeting Rosemary Agnew, the Ombudsman, Nicky McLean, SPSO Director, and John Stevenson, Head of Improvement, Standards and Engagement, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. And I invite Rosemary Agnew to make a brief opening statement. Um, good morning. Thanks for inviting us. Um, I just really wanted to highlight a couple of things up front. It feels a bit odd for us, this, if I'm honest, because this particular financial year was nearly a year ago. So it, it's been quite refreshing reading it in light of what we've been doing in, in the current year. But what I really wanted to highlight was um, this was my first full year as Ombudsman. And my two major priorities for this year were my own staff and my team's well-being, um, health, and you know how how they were experiencing work, but also clearing our backlog of complaints that had built up from a period when there were exceptionally high volumes, and in doing those two things, reflecting on how we operate as an organisation ourselves, because a lot of the planning we did that doesn't show in this report is what we are now putting into place in terms of um, progress with the organisation. So I, I just wanted to put it in that context, because whilst the, the numbers and things in here are really important, and there were some very clear messages coming through, um, it was very much a, a focus on a keep business going to plan for the future, starting with um, our new strategic plan that we laid for this year. So thank you for the opportunity to um, speak and we'll do our best to answer all your questions as fully as we can. OK, thanks very much for that update and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting stuff comes from it later. But at last year's evidence session, the Ombudsman spoke about certain groups who do not traditionally engage with SPSO services, for example, female prisoners and young people. What work has been done since then to address those concerns? Um, what we are doing is... It's part of a wider suite of um, work that we're looking at in terms of identifying groups and how to reach them, but also what we learn from our own complaints in terms of customer feedback. Now, one of the, um, I think, the challenges for groups that don't use us is you don't know if they need to. There may be a perfectly good reason why there are particular groups that don't make complaints or go to the Ombudsman, and we're limited with how far we can demand information to find those things out. But what we are trying to do, and it's work that started now, is look more holistically at how we measure impact and how we engage with our stakeholders. So one of the big pieces of work for us at the moment is mapping out a, a, a proper stakeholder framework so that we can target our limited resources in a different way um, and for example one of the things that um, we did recently was we met with Accountability Scotland and an ADHD group from Perth um, because there are particular challenges for ADHD um, those who have ADHD and it's not specifically and always in relation to the SPSO it's in relation to engaging with public services. 
So we've started that journey with them. We're, we're actually, um, the group is going to come in and talk to all of our staff about the challenges they face in accessing public services because that can then translate into the context within which we consider complaints, within which John's team who set model complaints handling procedures can perhaps build in advice. Um, it's a perennial problem, and if I'm honest, I don't know the answer, but what we're trying to do is be more targeted, and rather than try and do everything, target specific groups at a time where we think there may be a large number. Um, so. Can I ask, um, just to go to one of the groups that I mentioned, women prisoners, for example, has there been any work done to make life a bit easier for uh, them getting their complaints heard? Yes, in the last year we've worked closely with the Scottish Prison Service to, to look at the culture within the organisation to one that, that truly uh, values complaints. And within that we've uh, worked to develop uh, three e-learning modules for the SPS that are specific to the prison rules and encourage complaints to be welcomed, welcomed and made. So the three modules that we've developed were, uh, first of all, for the, the frontline resolution aspect of complaints, so targeted to the uh, frontline residential managers within the SPS. The second one we developed was about the internal complaints committee. And the third one we developed was around the, the role of governors. And one of, the things, one of the things that governors do is look at sensitive complaints and complaints from vulnerable groups. So we took a kind of holistic approach to managing complaints within the SPS and we've worked to develop those products which were uh, signed off uh, around about nine, nine, ten months ago. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's great. But uh, are these being taken up by the prison service and have you seen any impact, positive impact from them? They are, they are being taken up by the, the SPS. We, uh, we've, at this stage, we've not seen uh, any impact uh, in that respect. But one of the things that we're going to be doing quite soon is, uh, is working with the new uh, the prisons uh, inspector to, to look at how the, the prisons inspector in, inspect prisons uh, in, in relation to complaints in vulnerable groups. Uh, and we'll look to have an ongoing liaison with that organisation uh, also. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, just on, on, on another matter, the introduction of the Strategic, strategic Risk Register, uh, what does it include, why was it needed, and what previous risk management arrangements were, were there? This was part of a piece of work that we've concluded this year. We've, we we redid our governance systems, and what we have is and had and still look at <coughs> regularly is, is quite a low-level thing, things that are specific to us, specific to areas of work. But what we felt was missing was that strategic look at things that come from the outside world, if you like, in a different way, um, because those are where we perhaps might need to identify different approaches, different risks. Um, it's also something that I wanted to be able to publish because a risk register um, at, at quite a low level, it has a lot of information in it that uh, isn't for, for general publication, um, however much you want it to be. So we also felt that if we had a strategic register which had the big things on it, and you know, for one, one of them, for example, is, uh, I hate to say the Brexit word, but there, there is a risk associated with that. There are risks associated at a, a, ma a, a macro level with things like um, security and data. Um, and it was to try and give some reassurance to anybody looking at our information that our risk is based in um, understanding the big issues as well and that we've got assurance systems in place to address them. OK, thank you. Uh, Alec? Good morning. Last year, the Ombudsman suggested that the SPSO was adequately funded for the level of work that you had at that time. Is this still the case? Oh, I'll always say no to that, won't I? Um, I, I think... If everybody turned up for work every single day and nothing had changed, the answer would be we probably were adequately funded. But what we are observing, and we think it is the consequence of the effect of model complaints handling and better complaints handling by public bodies, is we've seen an increase in the number of cases 
that require investigation, often very detailed investigation. So complaint numbers this year are comparable at this point to last year. But what there is is a 12% increase in the number of cases that we have to do a lot more work on. And it's that work that is the resource intensive, it's the investigation work. If, you know, for example, in a, a, a complex health complaint, it might require four different inputs from different clinicians and experts. And I would say we're on a knife edge. We are just about coping. But I think it's also important to stress that it's not just about throwing resources at things. One of the things that we've been doing throughout the year is looking very critical. We've effectively, um, as a new ombudsman, I have effectively been doing a review since I started and we're putting things in place. And that's looking at the service that we deliver and the efficiency within which we deliver it. So, for example, um, in the investigation team, we've had a, a major structural change. Um, and that might not sound a lot, but we've restructured the team so that anybody making a complaint, when they get allocated to an investigator, it's the same person for the whole complaint. We've taken out steps to make it better experience for customers and more efficient for ourselves. I, I don't know if you want to add anything in, Nikki. I, I think the, um, the the other side of the coin is obviously um, what, what um, public bodies are doing in handling complaints. And I think this year we've done a lot of work around how we can better to support public bodies and we'll be launching a new support and intervention policy on the 1st of April. Um, and that is very much about trying to identify <laughs> where we can really target um, specific public bodies because it, um, a, a significant proportion of our work inevitably will always come from the largest public bodies in Scotland, so it's really important that we help those organisations work as efficiently as possible. I mean, I, I, I do, I do um, realise that by the time a complaint gets to you, it's been through, so if we take a large local authority, it's been through their complaints procedures to get to you. Um, I noticed that a higher number of complaints were updated, upheld, compared to the same period for the previous year, 60% as opposed to 54%. So, so that leads me to perhaps a couple of questions. Firstly, how effective are the complaints procedures and processes within public organisations, given, given the person will have exhausted all of them in order to get to you? And secondly, we live in a, a time of austerity. We still live in a time of austerity that's had a major impact on, on public services. Is there any co correlation between the, 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 the massive job losses and the impacts of austerity on public bodies and their ability to handle complaints, but also perhaps their ability uh, not to handle uh, services to the point where people end up complaining? I think I had an easier leave than this. Um, I'd say there are a number of points in that, actually. If we think about um, the rise in the num percentage that we've upheld, that's, I think, a reflection of the fact that complaint handling is improving. And so the, if you like, more straightforward complaints just don't reach us anymore. We've had a big drop in the number of... Um, premature complaints coming to us. And I think what we're seeing is the consequence of the fact that the simpler ones just don't reach us in the same way or the same volume that they used to. What it tells me is that in terms of support and intervention and the work we do with public bodies, we um, now need to think about how we support them on the more complex complaints and you know, start developing you know, perhaps more guidance on, on that. Um, but it's also for me about, um, I think we're seeing, particularly in some sectors, a change in culture and approach to complaint handling. And I think the local authority sector is a good one that, um, I mean, you've got a lot of 
data yeah. on that, John? You, you, I think one of the things you asked is how, how effective is the, the model approach? And uh, we know through uh, benchmarking and uh, the complete numbers, how, well, we get a feel for how uh, effective it is. So if I tell you for that particular sector, the local authority sector, there has been a downward trend in the number of complaints received by local government in Scotland over the last three years. And in fact, in the last year, it went down by about 17%. So in 16-17, local government received 75,700 complaints. In 17-18, they received 62,800 complaints. So quite a downward trend there in complaints received. And of that, that population of complaints, when we track it through that model complaints procedure, in that last year, 89.9% .9 of complaints, of all complaints, were closed at stage one within five working days. So I think for the majority of people who access the complaints procedure, it works and it works well. Clearly there will be these very complex complaints where the breadth and depth of the issues complained of, uh, it's very difficult to seek or, or to achieve resolution. And those are the ones that we're seeing come to SPSO. And of course, those are the ones that are more and more complicated where we do find uh, issues that are upheld, whether it's all of the complaint or part of the complaint. But I think in terms of the effectiveness of the model complaints procedure, when you compare it to what was in place several years ago to now, it is without doubt uh, effective. But we're not complacent because one of the things we're doing just now, and we're currently doing this, is reviewing the effectiveness of the model complaints procedures to see if and where they can be improved further. And we just closed a survey yesterday with public bodies across Scotland to get their feedback on, on that. Yeah. yeah the, the other question you asked was about resources um, in, in the wider sense. I, I don't think we see enough complaints to be able to say there is a direct correlation because although it's a lot of work to us, it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's out there. What we do see, though, are um, themes and occasional issues that come up that could be indicative of resourcing issues in public bodies. So, for example, within health complaints, communication is a constant theme that comes through on complaints. Now, I can see if you are, um, you know, if you're a ward sister and you have a, a lot of people to look after and you've got fewer nurses because for various reasons there aren't as many there, then it, it is more of a challenge to have that level of engagement that you would want to have. Um, and another example is we've, we've only had a few, but we have now had a few complaints about um, treatment time guarantees, waiting times, which health boards are not meeting and their, their obvious question is are they not meeting them because they're not trying to or they just don't have the resources or there isn't the resource there so I think rather than us say we think there is a, a correlation what we do is highlight um, in our reports um, and perhaps draw those to, to the attention um, of others when we, we issue them to say you know, this has come up. The treatment time guarantee one is actually one that I did alert the, the government to as well. Right, thank you, Alec. And <coughs> uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I should draw the committee's attention to the fact that I'm a member of the Scottish corporate body which provides the resources for the Ombudsman. Um, you say in your note to us, and indeed it's reflected in your report, that the biggest concern you have relating to resources is these complex cases which take longer, which, you, as you just indicated, um, uh, and you've had an increase in, in, in them. Um, you, you hinted that partly that might be because simpler ones are, are disappearing. You're just going to be left with more complex ones. But um, can you say a little bit more about whether you think that's a trend that will continue? Mm, I, I think it's, it's probably close to running its course. The last sector to um, take on the model complaints handling was the health sector. So um, there are things still bedding in for them and we're still giving support to them. Um, I'm not sure that will make a huge difference in terms of complexity though, because health cases of um, complaints are often very complex. Um, I, I think sort of forward thinking, um, the links that we now need to be making are to see how we can help organisations look at those complex complaints. Um, 
the simpler ones, I, I think they're probably there with them. The, the other thing that I think is worth um, thinking about as well is that there, we talk about engagement with a complaints process, engagement with a complaints system, but actually this is about engagement with public service. And your engagement with public service ideally shouldn't end up as a complaint. It should end up as in, I've got great public service, thank you. Um, and so one of the things that um, we are very keen on developing through our work on is this learning from complaints. Because if you learn why something went wrong, hopefully it doesn't go wrong next time. And I think that's an area where perhaps um, there is greater scope for improvement further down the line. But in terms of the, the, the more straightforward ones, I suspect we've, we've reached the, about the limit there. I don't know if you want to add anything, either of you. I, I would agree entirely with what you, you say. I think of all, we, I've spoken before about the, the indicators that we use across the sector to measure and understand complaints <coughs> performance, and one of those indicators is learning from complaints. So the numerical ones are easy to record. The learnings have been more of a challenge, and I think that's an area that across the sectors in Scotland and, and my own team could do, do more work in, and it's something that's on our uh, agenda moving forward. Just going to add, I think the data supports what um, Rosemary is saying. So um, at the moment, the number of cases moving through to investigations, it's falling within local authorities, but it's rising within the health sector. So you can see because it's a relatively, um, relatively young to the CH, the complaints handling procedure, it's not bedded in yet. So I think that that will continue to rise until it's better established, probably over the next year and a half, two years. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, moving on, there's been a reduction in requests for reviews from 309 to 230. That's obviously uh, uh, welcome. Is there any further comment you could make on why that's the case? Um, I don't know why that's the case. Um, I think part of it is a reflection of improvements that we make. You know, we, we've, we do a lot of... Um, work with the, the team about um, communication, um, you know, explaining reasons clearly, um, use of, of clear language, and we get very good, uh, have had very good customer feedback on um, engagement and use of clear language and explaining our decisions. And if things are explained well, then they're understood better, and I would hope that's one contributory factor. Um, I think th we can't ignore the fact that um, when we are complete, when we had the backlog of ca cases and were very, very up against it, um, there were, were times when I think we were so focused on getting through the work that maybe we didn't always explain things well. And um, very, very few. Um, decisions are overturned or cases reinvestigated. Um, but what I'm seeing as a trend now is because work has settled a bit, is a lot less re explaining. And the reviews uh, requests that I'm seeing are the ones where fundamentally somebody really disagrees with our conclusions and decision. Um, it's probably worth remembering. Um, uh, pointing out one of the other things that we are about to do. Um, the way that complaints are closed, if you like, once they're investigated, is there's either a public, a full public report, and that goes to both parties in draft um, before we make our final decisions about the, um, the complaint, and then it's published. At the moment, when we close cases in decisions that are by letter, what we do is we write the letter, and we send it to both parties. And then if they have new information or they think that we've got something factually wrong, they ask for a review. Um, what we're doing from the 1st of February is before we make a final decision, we're actually going to send our provisional decisions to both parties in the same way that we do reports so that we can engage, particularly, I think, for complainers who really will want to have a say, that they usually have a say afterwards, um, 
and so that we can um, again reduce the number of review requests that we get. So it's, it's still giving people opportunity, but it's at a different time. Um, and we think that that is a, an, a it's going to be quite a, a, a lot of work in the short term for us because it's a, a fundamental change in approach. Um, but the experience I have is that even when we don't uphold complaints following a review, we get equal amount of, do you know, I don't agree with you, but thank you for the explanations. And that, for me, is a, a learning because I've learned a lot, the three of us have, about the feedback from complaints. Um, we still always get the, um, I don't agree with you, you haven't looked at it, and I'm going to write to the papers and tell them all what a terrible shower of people you are. Um, but the reviews are going down, I think, because we are not as stretched, although we are stretched with resources, and we've done work on um, communication ourselves. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks very much. Um, <coughs> on to complaint handling timescales. Um, for early resolution complaints, they're the one that uh, has um, your targets of, of uh, the, the, the percentage being met has dropped from 88 to 85.3. Uh, are there any particular reasons for that, or is that just... I, I think it was clearing the backlog yeah. because there were cases that sat there for you know a number of weeks before they were um, looked at and decided. So by definition, they were going to take us longer before we started. Um, so that, I think, is, is the predominant reason. We're also looking again at timescales um, and we'll be setting new performance indicators next year um, in light of the procedural changes we've made. Because uh, feedback from complainers is often, I'd rather you took a bit longer and, and had a really, really good decision that I'm really confident in. Um, so what we're looking at is um, whether we need to allow a bit more time for the earlier ones, um, but still maintain performance um, as it is on the, the longer scale ones, because um, I really do not want complaints that um, take more than a year. Some do, inevitably, but we want to reduce those. So actually <coughs> allowing ourselves a bit more time early on, I think, would be beneficial for us and complainers. And just finally for me, um, in terms of your uh, complaint uphold rates, I note that the, the water sector is significantly higher at 73%. Um, what's wrong with water? I'm going to let ask Nikki to answer that. That's her favourite subject, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I'm happy to answer the question. Um, I think that um, in the water sector, what's happened is, in terms of business-to-business -business providers, you've got a number of uh, new organisations coming into that sector that are... Um, that are less experienced in following a standardised complaints process and that is impacting on the numbers um, and people are not being signposted properly through the complaints process and I think it is largely um, inexperience of working with the complaints process um, within these, these businesses. Um, we are working with uh, Wix to try to address that um, and try to work with these providers so that they get a better better grip and that's something that um, John's team have been working on. Yeah, we, we did some uh, scanning of the, the water landscape to see what information was out there for customers and uh, for many organisations it either wasn't there at all or it was erroneous or it didn't signpost or the timescales were too long so there is uh, quite, quite a bit of work to do with that sector I think to, to adopt that standardised and simplified approach that values complaints and gets people through the process uh, eff efficiently. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, Alec, you're go going to come in here. One question, and then yeah. Alexander. The, just really a quick one in terms of the new system of recording inquiries that was introduced in, in 1617. Um, what is the impact to that been, and are there other benefits, ongoing benefits to that new system? So, um, in terms of the recording inquiries, I, I think um, we. Uh, and the impact was that um, 
it was more of a technical change in terms of how we record things as to whether or not they're a complaint. And previously, um, I think we'd done it depending on the type of contact, that uh, the way in which someone was contacting us, whereas we just simplified and clarified the definition of how we record, whether it's an inquiry or a complaint. So I think it was more a kind of technical reporting issue than anything else. OK, thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Alexander and then Annabelle. Thank you, convener. In your overview, you talk about the, the challenge of complaint handling and learning from complaint handling. And I think you've already identified some processes in questions that have already been asked. And you've said that you're just about coping. Uh, but that would infer to me that some of these public bodies are not coping. Uh, and it may be, as we've already discussed, because of the demands they have, uh, the stress situation or the, uh, the resources. These all have implications uh, for that to ensure. But at the end of the day, training and support are vitally important. Uh, can I be asked you to develop some of that in your views as how you believe that is now helping in some ways, or is it not enough support and there's not enough training in some sectors and that's what's creating? Uh, and, and in amongst all of that, you've got communication. And nine times out of ten, a, re a, a complaint happens because of a communication breakdown. Um, just let me pick a, a few of those. If I start with... Um, I'm going back to the model complaint handling for now because one of the things that that has introduced is links, clearer links into governance arrangements. Because I would say before model complaints handling, complaints were something done over there. So part of the aim of this is not just about handling complaints, it's also about monitoring and bringing it into the governance landscape. Because if it's not in the governance landscape, there will not be learning at an organisational level. There will not see a need to identify uh, or even identify that actually you're not meeting time scales. Why is that? So I think in some sectors, and the, the local authority um, sector is a good example of where they have an active complaint handlers network, and we're seeing the benefits of that. If we look at training in a specific way, we offer as an organisation training at cost. And it's pretty well used. Um, we also, as part of our um, stakeholder engagement, um, something I'm keen to develop is more seminar-based things. Because if we can, within our limited resource, deliver some of those and turn it into guidance on complaint handling, we get over one of the barriers for public bodies, and that is how do you prioritise training on complaints above training on patient safety? So if we can contribute to that through our resources, and this is very much down to a resource thing. Ideally, we'd love to be able to do you know, more e-learning packages like we did for the prison service. But I think part of it is this push that invest in good complaint handling and link it into your governance so that you learn from it, you are more likely to see other improvements. Um, I think as well, there is, there is still a long way to go, I would say, in having every sector at the same point on the journey. So one of the, the other major pieces of work, Nikki mentioned it earlier, was our support and intervention policy. What we are doing is making much better use of our own data. We are monitoring and recording the way the outcomes from complaints, the recommendations we make, and we are looking for themes. Um, and the whole idea of the support and intervention policy is it's a journey. If we identify an organisation that needs, we think might need help, we will offer it as far as we can um, within the resources. The ultimate is we have powers under the um, SPSO Act, and 
if an organisation, by the time it reaches very senior level, just does not improve, then I think we need to think about how we use our powers. But for me, the, the prize comes in that support bit. And, and this is... Um, we're, we're, we're launching now. We've, we've just developed it, and it will be in place from the 1st of April. Um, we have got some examples of where we have worked with specific organisations, so we've um, with um, Lothian um, NHS, where we have seen palpable results. We have seen improvements. And, and I think once um, organisations start to improve and realise that they can it is quite energising as well. Actually, it wasn't as bad as we thought to do that. Um, so I, I don't know if either of you want to, I didn't particularly jump from your team. Yeah, I think the, it, <coughs> one of the early questions was about resources and in terms of training, uh, to put it in context, uh, although we have a very effective training unit, the resource is essentially one full-time equivalent. It's a training uh, officer who gets ad hoc support from the organisation throughout the year. So given the scale of the sector, we can't deliver training alone uh, but one of the other things that we do within my team is to develop tools to help complaints handlers. So tools around quality assurance, tools around decision making, tools around uh, complaints improvement and the culture within the organisation. And, you know, those tools all lend themselves to uh, creating an environment that values complaints, that values quality, that values learning and so on. And there is a certain responsibility in the bodies themselves to take those <coughs> tools that are freely available uh, and, and use them. So, uh, from a resource point of view, we would love to deliver far more training courses, far more training products, and so on. But there is a there's a cost benefit analysis. And, and you know, the, the the bodies themselves have a duty to try and provide the training internally, so that their staff are up to speed. Uh, and you talk about culture. Uh, there is a culture that people feel sometimes when they are when they are taking on a health board. Uh, or, or they have a difficulty, uh, that, that the organisation uh, is vast uh, and, and does not give uh, the right information and doesn't support the customer uh, or, or, or the complainant. Uh, uh, they try to protect the organisation themselves. Uh, and, and we see that and we hear that on a regular basis. So how do you feel that that whole culture needs to be managed for the future to, to give people the confidence uh, in putting forward complaints and not having to deal with this culture of secrecy or or, or, or behind uh, the communication and all of that that, that, they, that they find themselves in? I, I think there's, there are a number of approaches to this and um, Nick is going to comment on how we respond to complaints that we investigate as well. Um, but I would say because we see a top slice of complaints we see different practices and we see different standards in different organisations. It's not always even sectoral. And part of monitoring our own work is to try and identify those so that we can directly um, become involved. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, how do you tackle a bigger issue within organisations themselves? Well, you start with the the obvious ones. You start with the, is it clear on your website how to give feedback and make a complaint? You know, if you've got to, you know, go through three different web pages and it doesn't pop up easily, then in my view, you're not meeting, um, being even vaguely helpful. Um, but this has to, I think, run alongside giving feedback as well. Can you have a culture where what you want to do is put things right before they become a complaint. If somebody raises an issue, and, and that is a journey that I would say if we use, uh, look at some public bodies are really good at it. You know, you, you see examples of um, you know, having meetings, even after they've answered the complaint, to try and help people understand where it went wrong and they try to engage. You see others where, um, you know, frankly, the complaint, they just didn't answer the question. And I think those are the ones that when they come to us, we do something about, which I'll ask Nikki yeah. to comment on. So, so I think it's um, really important that where we do see poor communication and uh, and 
not necessarily poor communication from a technical perspective, but poor communication from an interpersonal level that we call that out as well. Um, we do uh, now record where there are complaints handling issues on cases where the complainant hasn't raised that as an issue. Um, and that would include the type of language that's been used within the complaint responses. We also do record and give feedback on how the public body has engaged with us, because I think culturally that sends a very clear signal, uh, not just us, but other scrutiny bodies, other regulatory bodies. I think it's really important that we're open and transparent about that interaction um, because it tells you about the culture within the organisation. So we are now gathering that intelligence. And um, as Rosemary says, I think it is really important that although we're only seeing a small number of cases, you can start to build up a picture, not just on the basis of the complaints people bring, but the interaction during the complaint process and that we monitor and we track that. And, you know, and you've identified that there are there are a number that do it well, but there's also a number that do not. Uh, and it's trying to make sure that they, they are then scrutinised and they are governed to ensure that they improve. Uh, and the, the reason behind their lack of improvement may well be that they don't have the resource, they don't have the, uh, the time scale, they don't have the staff uh, that, to make that happen. Uh, and that's very difficult for you then to, to try and manage that situation. Uh, and you can point them in the right direction, but if they're not able to cope and they're not coping with the situation, it's only going to get worse. I, I think Alexander's put a bid in for your PR officer, but uh, <laughs> uh, can, can I just remind mm. everybody, you don't need to get everybody to answer every question. I, I would have thought that was more a, a statement than a, than a question, to be honest, but if you want to answer it, feel free. Can I just say I'll note it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank Content you. with that. Hey, OK. Uh, Annabelle? Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, looking at the uh, the role that the SPSO has taken over as independent reviewer uh, of decisions on the Scottish Welfare Fund, which I think you're in your 1718 represented the second year of uh, that role. Um, I, I, as far as I understand it, crisis grant reviews have increased by over a third in the last year, about 36%. Um, of course, at the same time, we're seeing a number of things, austerity already referred to, also the rollout of universal credit. So, for example, in Fife, uh, in 17-18, the number of uh, crisis grants awarded increased by about 14%, and we see the rollout of universal credit in Fife. I just wonder, from your perspective, at the other side of this, looking at uh, the crisis grant decisions made and the increase in the number of the reviews, um, do you see any connection between these issues? Do you foresee, therefore, that as long as the other two constants remain, austerity and universal credit rollout not being halted, that you will see a further increase in reviews and crisis grants uh, in, in the year ahead? I'm not sure we will. Um, the, the links to um, benefit and waiting, um, particularly in terms of waiting um, for, for benefit, um, where we are seeing um, issues is perhaps in lack of clarity in the guidance, the government's statutory guidance on handling um, uh, the, the, the reviews. Um, and we've, we've just this week um, sent our comments back for the annual review. Um, I, I suspect that it's one of those things where um, it will will always maintain a link, but it might not be austerity. It might be something specific to an area, that they go up in an area. Um, there'll always be a link to demographics as well. You know, when you look at the, the areas that have the, the, the highest number, they will tend to be the, those where there are those most in need. Um, as to whether it will change in terms of proportions, I, I don't really have a feel for it. I don't know if you uh, have anything's come through the team. <coughs> I, I was going to say, I think what's interesting is that the uphold rate on <coughs> crisis grants, we're only in our, um, we've only been uh, providing this function for two years, but the uphold rate is remaining constant. So there's not an indication that the decision making is getting poorer in that area. Um, but, I, but I think there is some evidence to suggest that there is, there is a link. 
um, with the rollout of universal credit because of some of the delays that that can inevitably cause. But I, I, I don't think that we've got a big enough data set to be able to say that for definite. Yeah, so when you come before us uh, next year, it may be that you have a bit more information in terms of the experience you will have gained by that stage. Yeah. That yeah. is the case, yeah. and it's also the case that um, I think the, the bigger indicator would be um, the data sets from local authorities mm -hmm. as it is with complaints. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where the analysis, the, uh, analysis, I think, would give you a better picture. Okay, so it's watch that space, really. Um, with regard to the... Um, Scottish Welfare uh, Fund uh, review role that the SPSO now performs, unlike your other roles, uh, the complaint can be made by telephone, and I understand that you're seeking uh, to have that to be the, the position with respect to all uh, complaints. Um, in terms of your experience, though, uh, in, in terms of telephone access for the um, community care grants and crisis grant reviews, I mean, what has been your experience? Do you feel that you would be able to seamlessly move to uh, extending that facility, the telephone facility, for access uh, across the board, or would other things need to happen before before that? I, I think it place? would have to be in context of it is another way of mm. making a, a complaint. I mean, we try and get around it as as far as we can, but ultimately there has to be a complaint in writing unless there are exceptional reasons. And the unfairness to me of this is it's the complainer who has to demonstrate exceptional reasons. Um, we can't universally say, oh, everybody from that sector can just make them by phone now. What I think it, it gives us is the flexibility to adapt access to the way in which access is needed. There will always, I, sus I think, be a predominance of filling in a, a a, a form on the website or what have you but for me this is part of the journey of being able to actively um, put the message out there to um, advocacy groups to citizens advice if there is somebody who um, wants to make a complaint but they find the the, the written you know doing it that way a barrier then there is this option now um, at the same time Thanks to our um, office move, we have a new telephony system and what we will have is the ability to be able to record calls. And I think that's um, important because it's a way of being able to capture the information um, easily as well. So that's something that um, we're looking at at the moment because obviously we've got um, data protection um, considerations. I don't think we could ever move to a every complaint by phone without significant resource increases. So what we have to do is look at being as accessible as we can using the phone, um, but also putting it in context of what we, we can do with what we have. Okay, I'll you and then sure. The other one, uh, Graham, I'm going to let Graham ask his questions because he can follow on from that yeah. question you've, you've got there. Uh, yeah, on, just you got one to last finish that, I had one right, last yeah, on that yeah, bit yeah. before we get... Uh, so, um, in terms of the, the general accessibility uh, position, um, I note that uh, the SPSO is currently um, looking at the position of British Sign Language, and just perhaps you could update us as to where, where that work is. Um, we have already made some changes to our website. We have a, a wider British Sign Language plan, um, and we're working with other office holders um, we're doing some joint work there to see if we can't make use of resources. We, we, we do as much as we can. Um, we've still got a journey to go on it, but the, main, the most important things are uh, in terms of, for us, accessing our service that is available now um, in BSL on our website. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. Thanks, Convener. And, um, uh, my, my questions... Uh they really do follow on from that because you've been asking um, for legislative changes um, in, in, in a couple of areas. Um, one is around the accessibility, which Annabelle Ewing has uh, touched on. Um, it does seem ab absurd that you know people have to prove exceptional circumstances to be able to make a complaint by phone. Um, so that's the that, that's the first area, and and the other is to give you the ability uh, to 
launch your own investigations at your, your own initiative. Uh, so before we look at e each of those, um, you wrote to us this earlier this month um, and you say that you're concerned about the lack of progress on this following discussions with, with the Scottish Government um, and that you've not yet had a definitive or final response for them. Can you tell us a bit about the discussions that have been going on um, and why you th why have we got this lack of progress, given that you've been talking about this for some time? Well, the the issues were, you know, they were there shortly after I took up office, and we put a, a, a case together um, for you know, those with the policy responsibility, setting out the various different things, and you know, the discussions have been really positive. Um, and there was an indication, oh, yeah, we think we can do this by a, uh, an order. We think that might take primary legislation. Then there's a change in staff. And we sort of felt we had to, we had to start all over again, because despite um, a very comprehensive um, case, oh, we need more, we need more. So we had to basically re-engage again. And then there's a change in staff. And that combined with... In the government, uh, that in that particular area that we were dealing with. So each time that we've had um, discussion, it's always been, you know, very positive. I, I'm not uh, at all critical of um, the engagement itself, but it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. And I don't know if it's stalled because of um, lack of interest or whether it's um, too low down the priority order. Um, but we just feel that we keep saying the same thing, so I'm going to try and find a different way of saying it to Parliament, I think. I have to say, it sounds a bit absurd that uh, the government uh, stalls on something just because there's been a change of staff. That doesn't seem I, I don't. I don't know enough about how the, the um, government right. works, okay. but it, it is... I think it's... I don't want to be hypercritical, but I'm very frustrated that, for example, the issue of a complaint in any format, I don't think is a primary legislative change. No. How much does it take to put an order through Parliament right. well, for something that is self-evidently to, to the benefit of everybody? I, I, I was going to ask about this, because obviously one of, one of the changes you're looking for... Uh, may well require le legislation, but that that one, the accessibility, is probably quite simple, so they probably don't need to happen at the same time. No, they, that, they wouldn't that, have to. That would be your view, so the accessibility one could, could happen quite quickly, quite easily. It just needs a will to do it. Well, I think so. I think we think so, don't we? Yeah. OK. Um, so let's look at the... Um, where the, the bit where you're looking uh, for the power to take <coughs> your own initiative, launch your own investigations. Um, this power exists in, in other countries. Um, mm. And you point in your letter to Ireland where you say they've been very effective at raising issues faced by vulnerable groups, a voice for the voiceless. And that goes right back to the first question that the convener asked uh, about these hard-to-reach hard groups. Um, so it does seem uh, to be, to be a, would be a positive thing to happen. Yeah, there, there, there are two sides to this. We, we are increasingly using the phrase public value investigations because there has to be a public value in, in doing them. Um, but it's a bit hit and miss to rely on a complaint coming in that's exactly about the issue you want to look at. Um, so, there for, for me, th there is something in there about having an ombudsman that is able to look at something that they would have looked at had there been a complaint, fundamentally. Um, but there's also... It's going to sound a bit like, you know, um, I've, I've had my happy pills or something for the morning. Um, I'm, I'm, I am really proud to be the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. I, I think Scotland leads the way in many things and I want us to lead the way in a modern ombudsman service and we don't even lead the way in the UK now 
um, both Wales and Northern Ireland have these powers. In fact, Northern Ireland right. has just launched its first um, uh, investigation. And I look at things that my European colleagues have achieved and you know, the, the Irish Ombudsman um, has achieved in adding value at inevitably a lot lower cost than maybe looking at 15 or 20 complaints about something. And, and so I think that we've, we've got a real opportunity to be able to use the skills we've got um, and the understanding we have <coughs> of public services from an ombudsman point of view to build in improvements and um, high or highlight issues. Some of it is about highlighting the issue. And it comes back to the, the point I was saying earlier that you don't engage with a public service to make a complaint. You engage for the service. And it's, it's unlikely to be one off. You know, you don't have your bins emptied once. You have your bins emptied regularly. So if we can highlight things that can improve it at that end, not after the complaints come in. I think there is, is huge benefit to that. The other thing I would add is it's, it's not something that would be the main, the only thing we do. Complaints are important and always will be. Yeah, okay. Um, so finally, in your letter to us, um, you do say that you intend to lay a report before Parliament with, with proposals for legislative change. Can you tell us when we might expect to see that? Um, we are currently doing our business planning for April next year, for um, the next financial year. Um, I would like, ideally, um, to get something to you before summer recess, because I think it's something that needs to be looked at early. It's important to me, um, but we're still at the point of looking at all the priorities we've got, but um, that, that is my aim. Okay. Who would that go to, Ed? Um, I think I would probably lay it before Parliament generally, but send it specifically to this committee oh, in the first you. instance. We must have friendly faces. We do. Yeah, that's what it was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Annabelle. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Um, turning to the issue of uh, the um, SPSO becoming the uh, independent national whistleblowing officer, could you update the committee on what progress is being made? Do you want to do that, John? Towards that. Yes. Uh, the, the work falls out of the, the Francis Review, the Freedom to Speak Up. Uh, we have worked over the last year in, in collaboration with the, the Scottish Government, with uh, the, the sector, the NHS, with a whistleblowing organisation, with whistleblowers, to uh, develop through a, really through a process, I had a, 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 a project steering group and a project working group to develop a, a draft set of principles in relation to whistleblowing, uh, guidance in relation to whistleblowing, and standards in relation to whistleblowing. So the stage we're at just now is that, that draft work has been completed. Uh, the next stage is to go out to public consultation. Uh, we aim to do that in parallel with the Scottish Government uh, uh, consulting on the, the draft order. The draft order hasn't been uh, completed yet, so we're at the stage where we're waiting on the Government to finalise the draft order and then the two consultations will run in parallel. We're actually meeting with the government uh, next week to look at the timescales for that. Uh, so hopefully we, that, that will progress earlier this year. Timescales did slip um, a, a little because originally it was going to be um, boards, uh, but it's been extended to primary care. So yeah. it's, it's had to take account of that because obviously it will, um, there's a lot more work involved in that so it's the time scale for it actually coming into operation um, has has slipped and is likely to be uh, I understand at the moment closer to the autumn rather than the April but um, yeah. we we didn't have a we weren't concerned about the slip for the reason that it slipped sure. because this is so important I'd, I I want this to be as, as right as it can be because it's it, it differs from complaints in that it's a very personal thing to whistleblow and we have got to make sure that you know, the system supports everybody, mm -hmm. especially whistleblowers, um, in, in doing that. 
Sorry, Mr. Yeah, Sorry. I was going to pick up on that. One of the issues I'm always very clear about is, in terms of slippage, if, if you would call it that, it's more around giving boards and primary care providers sufficient time to plan and prepare for implementation. It wouldn't be uh, appropriate or fair, I think, to say, here's a new procedure and you need to implement it within two or three months. So the, the, the timescales now reflect the, the fact that primary care will be involved and primary care and the boards will need sufficient time to plan and prepare for effective implementation. And we'll take that into account when we meet uh, with the Scottish Government next week. Thank you for that. Just to, uh, so, I mean, obviously, it seems that involving primary care to that degree is eminently sensible uh, and uh, therefore, indeed, one can understand why it's important to do that, to get it right, given that this would be a very significant uh, change. Um, in terms of uh, the consultation, um, is there any um, idea yet about how long that will be? Will that be the kind of standard three months or...? something yeah. around that and presumably the SPSO office would intend to ensure that there was proper awareness raising at the time of the consultation because obviously you would want to have as many views uh, submitted yeah. as possible to that yeah yeah take we, the necessary steps to do that we, we will uh, we'll contact everybody who is uh, you know under our jurisdiction all the the, the appropriate organizations I, I i could just say as well i i should have said this earlier that in the last week or so, we've worked with the Scottish Government on some workshops around the, they're adopting a, a Once for Scotland uh, policy approach to the, the PIN procedures. And we attended to, to uh, give some advice on the, the whistleblowing procedure. I was very encouraged indeed that when we asked the, the people from the sector, what, what do you think a whistleblowing procedure should look like? What should it contain? The, the feedback we got was it really covered all the things that we've, that we've already got in the, in the draft procedure. So a clear definition, support for staff, support for people in the wider context who are involved in the whistleblowing procedure, uh, timeliness in terms of getting uh, the, the whistleblowing procedure through the, the procedure in good time, reflecting that there could often be a, a patient safety issue mm -hmm. uh, or, or keeping the person who raises concern at the heart of the process. So all the feedback we're getting from the sector at the moment is already reflected in those draft products that we have and we're ready to consult on. Yeah. Great, and perhaps in due course you can keep the committee advised at the relevant uh, stages mm -hmm. as to what's going on. Happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kenny, have you got any no. questions? Right, thank you. Well, uh, I'll just finish with this last one. You uh, decided to update the strategic plan midway through the usual four-year cycle. Was this to change direction in the strategic aims or was there any other reason for it? I think it was to put more focus on developing some of the things that were there and that we want to develop further, specifically um, more direct and obvious focus on the importance of learning from complaints, um, more direct focus on being a contribution to public service. It's not just about complaints, um, but also to have something that is really well rooted in our our, our values, um, because having it well rooted in our values, uh, so f for example, being people focused, um, that then influences the decisions that we make as an organisation, the approaches we take. So something as simple as saying we're going to restructure our teams so that somebody coming to us gets one investigator throughout the life of the complaint, that is rooted in a, in a value of being people-focused because that's what suits the complainer. The fact it helps us is good, but it's actually about people. It also means that we uh, have focus on our own people as well, um, because you know, we, we, have, we have some lovely, lovely people with strong values who are trying to do a really good job, and most of the time we do. Um, but every now and again, we need support, because it's actually hard work having to listen to some of the things that we listen to daily. So. This was all about vision and values and not just the direction, but who we want to be in following that direction. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, and I'd like to thank yourself, Rosemary, John and Nikki for your evidence this morning. That was very useful. I'm going to suspend very briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. Then we'll watch the stage.
Okay. Agenda item three is consideration of negative instrument 376 as listed on the agenda. I refer members to paper number three. This instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul it. No motions to annul have been laid. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not drawn the instrument to the Parliament's attention on any of its reporting grounds. Do members have any comments on the instrument? In terms of the consultation, paragraph 5, it says since, since October 2014, Scottish ministers have undertaken a number of public consultations and a proposal to exempt certain heritable securities from the 20-year security rule. I'm just wondering why... Um, you know, progress wasn't made at the time. Have we any idea? I mean, it isn't really very specific. All it, be, all it really goes on to say is, um, uh, you know, that the, uh, the consultation was completed several years ago and the order couldn't be pursued at this time. Um, so do we know why? We, we've got no idea. Yeah, uh, and it did go through the delegated power, so yes. I suspect if there was any questions, yeah. they, they would have been asked at that point. Yes, yeah. yeah. okay. Yes, we, we, we're happy to write and, and find out. Yeah, it's just, just a, a cute, because one would have, it, it does seem an inordinate amount of time between consultations. Okay, but given that the DLPR <laughs> no issues with it, uh, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Thank you. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I move the meeting into private.